Time magazine called him the unsung hero behind the internet. CNN called him a father of the internet. President Bill Clinton called him one of the great minds of the information age. He has been voted history's greatest scientist of African descent. He is Philip M. Iguali. He's coming to Trinidad and Tobago to launch the 2008 Kwame Ture Lecture Series on Sunday, June 8th at the JFK Auditorium, Uwe St. Augustine, 5 p.m. The Emancipation Support Committee invites you to come and hear this inspirational mind adjust the theme, crossing new frontiers to conquer today's challenges. This lecture is one you cannot afford to miss. Admission is free, so be there on Sunday, June 8, 5 p.m. at the JFK Auditorium, New East St. Augustine. In 1965, I was in the sixth grade in St. John's Primary School, Abo, Nigeria. In January 1966, I enrolled in St. George's Grammar School, Obinomba, Nigeria. Fifteen months later, I fled from Obinomba, Nigeria, to Onicha, Biafra. My Igbo-speaking family fled from Nigeria to Biafra, and we fled because thousands of Igbos from southeastern Nigeria were being killed in northern Nigeria. That organized killings of Igbos occurred from May 29, 1966, through through September 29, 1966, that civil uprising preceded the war between Nigeria and Biafra. That war began on July 6, 1967 and ended on January 15, 1970. One in 15 Biafrans died during that 30 month long war in the list of the worst genocidal crimes of the 20th century that was committed against humanity the death of one in 15 biafrans was ranked fifth in the evening of march 21 1968 the day my hometown of Onitsha was captured by Nigerian soldiers, we fled on foot and fled from 14 Mba Road, Onitsha, Biafra, to Merchants of Light School, Oba, Biafra. Tens of thousands of refugees that fled from Onitsha were camped at Merchants of Light School, Oba, Biafra. At about 6 o'clock of the following morning of March 22, 1968, we were alerted by fleeing refugees that advancing Nigerian soldiers had captured Onitsha and might capture our refugee camp of at Aoba and do so within a few hours. Scared, we continued our flight to Newi and Nobi and stopped our flight when we reached a refugee camp that was a former school classroom that was across the street from the Catholic Church in Okititi, Biafra. About five days after the war was over, or on about January 20, 1970, we returned as refugees and squatted for five months in an abandoned house that was along Portacot Road in the Fege quarters of Onitsha. In mid-1970, I began to teach myself physics, algebra, geometry, and calculus. About two weeks after I received a scholarship letter from Oregon, United States, that was dated September 10, 1973. I was in Lagos, Nigeria to apply for an international travel passport. Back in 1973, the Nigerian passport or its application forms cannot be received by mail. At that time, the Nigerian passport office in Kakawa Street, Lagos, Nigeria, had a reputation as a cesspool of corruption. 
all persons applying for the Nigerian passport spent months coming to the passport office and did so to monitor the progress of their applications. Nigerian travel passports were deliberately withheld by the chief passport officer in Lagos back in 1973 my travel passport was withheld until shortly after Christmas Day. My passport was withheld until I paid a bribe of five pounds to one of the passport touts. I had expected to be in the United States as early as June 1973 at age 18. I had applied for admission into American schools and I applied shortly after I had passed the entrance examination to the University of London that I took as an external candidate back in January 1973 in Onicha, East Central State, Nigeria. My Nigerian travel passport was issued in late December 1973 and after a six-month delay, I arrived in the United States on Sunday, March 24, 1974, and after a nine-month delay, and after paying a bribe of five pounds to a passport tout, who claimed that the chief passport officer gets a large commission from that bribe. That five pounds was a month's wage. My Nigerian travel passport was also withheld until I paid a presumably round trip airfare from Lagos, Nigeria to Portland, Oregon, United States. That two way airfare was in addition to my one way airfare to Portland, Oregon, United States. That two way airfare was called quote unquote repatriation fee but it was an extortion fee i paid for a round trip ticket but i was never given any ticket i paid 150 pounds or 30 months salary as the advance repatriation fee i paid the chief passport officer in lagos two and a half years salary for the privilege of leaving Nigeria to study in the United States. As a result of that exorbitant extortion from the chief passport officer, I arrived in the United States with only $134 or much less than the bribe that I paid the corrupt chief passport officer of Nigeria. I believe that my repatriation fee went into the personal bank account of the chief passport officer in Lagos, Nigeria. My first night outside Nigeria was spent in room 36 of Butler Hall, Monmouth, Oregon, United States. I checked into Butler Hall at about 6 in the evening of Sunday, March 24, 1974. Three months later, on June 20, 1974, I began programming the CDC 3300. That was the first supercomputer to be rated at 1 million instructions per second. That supercomputer was marketed seven years earlier as the world's fastest computer. By far, the most important contribution to the field of supercomputing is to attain a speed that was once impossible and then to harness that new speed to solve the grand, solve the grand challenge problems arising in science and engineering. Such a breakthrough in computational mathematics 
or the supercomputer solution of a grand challenge problem is particularly worthy of being a benchmark in the history of the computer. That breakthrough is not worthy if it changed the way we looked at the computer and the internet. With the supercomputer that communicates across processors and do so synchronously and computes within processors and do so simultaneously, we now have answers to previously unanswerable grand challenge questions. But back in 1974, my unanswerable question was how to solve a large system of equations of algebra and how to solve them across a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors that defined and outlined a new internet on June 20, 1974, the day I began programming supercomputers, the number of computer scientists in the world were few. That should not come as a surprise. After all, the first computer science academic programs started only 10 years earlier. For that reason, I was one of only 24 programmers from around the state of Oregon that were remotely logged into the supercomputer that was at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Covallis, Oregon, United States. Three months before I started programming supercomputers, I had arrived from Onicha, Nigeria. It seemed like I was catapulted from a slingshot from Onicha to Oregon. At that time, my family in Nigeria, while we are still struggling to pronounce the word Oregon, the slingshot that catapulted me to Oregon was a scholarship letter that was dated September 10, 1973. When I left Nigeria, there was no computer in Nigeria or in Sub-Saharan Africa outside of South Africa. Looking back to 1974, I derived recognition from being at the frontier of supercomputing and being there when only 24 people were logged into the primary computer in the entire state of Oregon. On the 16th anniversary of my entry into the frontier of supercomputing, trade publications and newspaper articles such as the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal wrote that I, Philip M. Aguale, had discovered a different way of looking at supercomputers. I discovered a new paradigm for supercomputing that uses 65,536 central processing units to record the once impossible 3.1 billion calculations per second. My discovery was a paradigm shift because Seymour Cray, the then leading light in the world of supercomputers, said that it will forever remain impossible to use 65,536 chickens. That was his metaphor for the as many slowest central processing units and use them to defeat one strong ox. That was his metaphor for the fastest vector supercomputers. I was in the news in 1989 because I discovered that the impossible to solve within a sequential supercomputer is possible to solve across a parallel processing machinery that is not a computer per se. That new machinery 
is a virtual supercomputer and is a new internet de facto. That new internet is a new global network of 65,536 central processing units. At a visceral level, I felt like a 19-year-old that sojourned from the heart of my ancestral Igbo land and across the Atlantic Ocean, beyond North America and beyond the North Pole, and sojourned to reach the 21st century's land of the spirits, or Alamo, namely the unexplored territory of the never-before-seen computer and the new internet. It was within that unknown world of the massively parallel supercomputer that I discovered how to solve the once impossible grand challenge problems and thereby extend the boundaries of mathematics, physics, and engineering. I made the impossible to solve, possible to solve. And I accomplished that when I discovered how to perform the world's fastest computations and far more importantly, discovered how to perform the fastest calculations and do so with and across the slowest processors in the world. Insightful and brilliant lecture.